So I'm completely overwhelmed. I mean, you know, Samuel told me, can you once talk a little bit about the beginning of Sunday to a few of us and the young people? And I said, oh, of course, but I didn't expect this kind of crowd coming here. But I think it's, a, it's really, I think it's a big compliment to Chris uh, Zulbrück, Christoph Lütti and the whole Sunday group at, the, at present because it shows that what their work is so much interesting for the Holy Avag. And I can tell you for a long time we were only wishing that this would be like this. So a dream is now coming fulfilled today for me personally. I also am extremely happy that uh, three persons are here, long-term companions that followed me through the most of the time in Sandek. Martin, at uh, first Brigitte Hauser, then Martin uh, Strauss and Martin Wegelin. And you know, when I prepared this, I really, from, I promise you, I stay to keep with real facts. <laughs> but if these three people feel, just cry and say, alternative facts, <laughs> or just tell me fake news. <laughs> but I try to keep with the real facts. Okay, so let me start with the, uh, with the big picture. Uh, probably most of you know that Sandek was in earlier day called IRCWD. For many this is sort of a mystery why it was IRCWD. I will first uh, talk about that a little bit. It goes back to 1968. And then I will mainly talk about the years when I was heading the, uh, the sound deck from 79, 80 to 2004 and uh, I will spend quite a bit of time on the development of the new concept, how this was done, why it was done and I think today sound deck is still following more or less this concept. Uh, so then I will talk a little bit about our first projects which I was alone at that time basically and uh, I did it mainly with external consultants. You will recognize some of the people there actually. Then in 1982 there was, uh, was a very important year because of Martin uh, Wegelin and Martin Schaus joined me and we formed research groups on water supply and treatment and the research group on excreta and waste water management. Well, group is a little bit exaggerated because it was each one person basically. <laughs> but that was sort of our vision that later on it will be a group. Then in 1980 was the formation of research group on solid waste management, first under my guiding and then of course Chris Hulbrook took over. <coughs> then in 1995 was the change from IRCWD to Sandek because we were actually tired to get these letters Dear Professor IRCWD, please send us as much information as possible on sanitation. And uh, so then we actually changed our name to SANDEC and SAN Sanitation in Developing Countries. And it was only in 1995 that we really got a department of INEAVAG before we were sort of a research group. And, uh, and then in 2000 was the formation of the research group on strate strategic and environmental sanitation planning. And uh, then in 2004, Chris Tupuk took over. So you see, in 2004, we had basically the structure that is still today valid. But <laughs> it changed quite a bit with regard to, per to persons. Actually, the, the beginning, it was a two women and ma one man show. So with me was Brigitte Hauser. Sorry, I didn't have any picture. She is here, <laughs> sitting here. Maybe you can stand up quickly so that people see you. Brigitte Hauser and, 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 and Sylvie Peter. And actually, I inherited them from the old IRCWD. Brigitte Hauser was the documentalist and secretary and Sylvie Peter, translator and, and editor of the IOCWD News. Now you feel that's very comfortable to have two support staff and one person, you know? <laughs> well, you must imagine at that time there was no uh, electronic uh, word processing. Everything had to be typed by, by Brigitte, retyped and retyped again <laughs> and so on and so on. 
and Sylvie Peter was actually the translator for whole Airbach. And uh, so, anyway, and then in 1982, as I said, uh, the, the scientific staff tripled. Uh, so that was in 94, the size in 94, 98, and then in 2004. Now here you see already some fames that are still here, Chris, Christoph, and so on and so on. This, by the way, is Dulai Kone, uh, who is now with Gates Foundation. So at the end I will show you the picture of Soundeck today. Looks again very different. <laughs> Uh, so let me go back to this old IRCWD, what is this mystery, it actually goes back to 1968. It was actually a suggestion by WHO to the government of Switzerland and Netherlands to have two uh, reference centers, one on uh, waste disposal, one on community water supply, and then the AIRVAG agreed to host the IRCWD here at AIRVAG. And uh, in, in, in Holland, it was then the IRC, which actually is still today called IRC uh, uh, for water and sanitation. What were these activities? Brigitte knows, would know much better than I do, because then I was not there. But what I understand, it was a documentation center, you must imagine. There was no electronic uh, databases at that time. There was no such thing as electronic search. So everything had to be done by hand, and Brigitte was sort of punching these cards, cards and putting, putting holes, in. holes in, and then the one <laughs> thumb fell down, and that was the one which was elected, so based on. Anyway, so, and then it was a publication uh, on compost, because this IRCW was very much linked to the, to the uh, Department of uh, Solid Waste Management, but it was not geared to developing countries at all. It was in general on composting, reuse and so on. And I think Martin Strauss was also sometimes working there on basically on reuse issues, but very general. Anyway, so one thing I would like to mention here, there were also study trips organized to Erwag and to Switzerland from uh, WHO follows from developing countries. And that was the only one I saw at that time, because I was in 76, I joined Erwag. There were these people here working at Erwag from Ghana, from Nigeria, working in the laboratory <coughs> on these high sophisticated uh, lab, uh, lab equipment. And I felt it's very strange that these people come here and work on these very sophisticated lab equipment. And then they went back and said to their, to their organization, we need a mass spec, we need a GC now, else we cannot do the work. So I felt this is probably not the right thing to do. But anyway, I was not involved in that at that time. Then came 1980, and that's when I, when actually the, the director, Werner Sturm, and uh, Hannes Wasmer, the deputy, and uh, Uli Bundi was also at the staff then, they invited me to come to their office and said if I would be willing to come up with a new concept of IRCWD. How can AIRVAG, with its wide scientific and uh, technical knowledge, best contribute to tackle the water problems in developing countries? I was very excited, but I was also a bit shocked. Uh, and I told them I would be very interested to do that, because I came back in 76 from my studies in Stanford, I worked in the engineering department for three years and I was always very interested in problems in developing countries uh, because I had a lot of contact with people especially from uh, Latin America, from Asia and already at that time I felt mm, the real problems are really not in Switzerland but they are in other parts of this world. And so I, I was always very interested in, in these issues. But I told them, I have never been working in developing countries. Don't you want to employ somebody who has experience in developing countries? And very interesting, they said, no, we are thinking about that too. We want to have somebody who knows Erwag quite well, what the strength of Erwag is. And you know, at that time, Erwag had about 150 people. We didn't need scrambled lunch. 
Okay? We didn't need scrambled lunch to meet at lunch tables. We automatically were sitting from people from other departments. I knew very well what the biologists did, what the uh, chemists did, of course engineering, because I was working in the engineering department. So they said, no, we want you to, to, uh, to, to, to do this. So I came... But I, they said to me, and that's very generous, I was extremely lucky. They told me, we give you a couple of months, you read and you visit people. You visit who, people, whoever you want, to, to get informed. So I went out with this question, what is the situation? What are the main challenging? Who is working in this field? Uh, what are the comparative advantage of Airwag to work on these challenges? So these were the the questions in my mind. And then I visited several people and I really would like to mention a few people here who influenced me tremendously. The first one is John Kalbermatten. He was at that time senior water advisor at the World Bank. And uh, he, he uh, was a Swiss, emigrated to the US, uh, uh, very young, but he always kept contact with Erwag and he knew exactly what Erwag is. And when I visited him at, at, at the World Bank, he told me he was very excited that Erwag wants to get involved in this. And the second thing he said, Roland, you have to help me to change the World Bank. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a big word, you know, for a young engineer. And he explained, he explained to me, look, we get, and he showed me on his shelf, he showed, look, we have all these projects. These are all uh, master plans from different countries, uh, different cities, especially in Africa at that time. And uh, these are all wonderful sewer systems designed, but we cannot fund them. They don't have water for, uh, for, for a sewage system. They would never be able to pay back these water loans. And especially they are not able to maintain and operate these things. And the people in World Bank don't understand this, Roland. We have to change that. I said, okay. And actually what he did, actually, he had already in 78 formed this UNTP World Bank Low Cost Water and Supply and Sanitation Project and the Technical Advisory Group with Richard Feacham, Duncan Mara, Mike McGarry, some of them you probably know by name. So I visited all of them and they already had prepared several documents Health, health and sanitation, they already had a sanitation field manual, they were planning or in, in, in preparation to do it. And very important also here, low cost technology options for, for, uh, for low cost uh, sanitation and water supply. And he said, look, there are existing technologies, but these technologies are not known or we don't know why they work or how they work and in which the circumstances they work. So and they, they even gave me the opportunity to go to Dar es Salaam because that was the latest of this project to go to Dar es Salaam and, uh, and see actually what these people do when they go to the toilet. What are their habits related to sanitation? So I did it with a, with a social scientist here, Hilda Kivasila, and I went to all these, to the houses, just to find out what are the habits of the people doing sanitation. Well, that was very strange for an engineer. But I do understand, that was the moment I understood that social science is, is the clue for this. And I think Bernhard can confirm that as long as I'm at Erwag, I was always fighting that there is a social science uh, department or social scientists, and not only for Sandek or IRCWD at that time, but for Erwag as a, 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 as a total. So that was a big impression that made on me. And then what I also learned is that uh, uh, in 1977, there was the first big conference on, uh, on water, actually, in Mar del Plata. And there it was decided that 1980 to 19 is the first international drinking water and sanitation decade. And look at the mottos. Water supply and sanitation for all by 1990. 
some for all instead of all for some. What does that mean? Make sure that everybody has a minimal service before everybody gets a, or, or some people get more. Sounds very familiar, isn't it? <laughs> when you think about the NDGs or the SDGs. And, uh, and we all know how the situation in reality looked like. From 80 to 90, well, for the supply went down a little bit. People without access, but sanitation stayed the same or kept just up with the population growth. And you know that till today, more than two and a half billion people don't have access to sanitation, for instance. So this was just a big, nice wish. Of course, what the problems why we were here working at that time, mainly working on nutrification issues, on nutrient issues, optimization of these big urban infrastructures. Uh, it was very clear that in developing countries, the big, big, big problem was related to safe drinking water and its sanitation. And these are actually exactly the wording that I used at that time. If you read what were the problems then, looks very familiar, it's still today, the same. Uh, so, one thing I also learned, which was important, that there, are existing, there were existing technologies used in different places in developing countries, developed in India, for instance, low flush uh, 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 toilets, the one in uh, the VIP in Zimbabwe. But the point is that it was all was very anecdotal. So one didn't know which systems work in which kind of places, under which circumstances. And that's what, 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 uh, what John Calvin Martin meant. He said, look, if a research institute like Erwag, which has quite a big, uh, was very, uh, uh, had, had a very good name, uh, then we can bring scientific evidence and find out why these, some, of these, uh, some of these systems work or do not work. Mm -hmm. So when I came back, I felt like this guy. <laughs> Huge problem, very little tool. I think our budget was about 250,000 at that time and uh, so but I said to myself after listening to all these people don't give up <laughs> don't give up and I also learned nothing is impossible <laughs> so that was sort of my motivation to to go ahead now where so, so I came back to the director and said, what are the key elements of, uh, of, of a new IRCWD? First of all, we have to have a group of people who work exclusively on problems in developing countries. You know, at that time, people from Erwag, they just did how I call helicopter consulting. They flew in, puff, looked around, gave good advice, got out again, and that was it. In good intention, but that doesn't work if you know, don't know the, the, the real situation. Said main focus should be on sanitation. Uh, many people worked in water supply. Sanitation was the very dirty, neglected brother of water and sanitation. Still, it is today a little bit. So what it also meant that we have to work and inter interdisciplinary, but it was uh, for me very important and what it actually mean, outsourcing, collaboration with other institutions. Of course, we were at Erwag, we had sanitary engineering, we had environment sciences, but we need to, p to work with people with uh, other expertise, especially in tropical health, epidemiology, and especially also with social scientists. Thematically focused, so we always said we have to, we have to be focused thematically, uh, we just always choose one theme, and I will come back and explain to you what I mean with that. For each of these groups, we work on one theme for a certain uh, time period, but we do geographically wide. It's, you know, in development aid, uh, uh, cooperation, it's usually such that people focus on different countries. 
we did just the, the other way around. Why did we do that? Because we knew there are good approaches in India. Would they fit also in Bangladesh or in uh, Zimbabwe? So I think learning South-South for us was, was very important. So I think that was the, uh, one of the important things as well that I suggested. I also suggested that we really should, because we were always a very small group, we should do much close collaboration with partners in developing countries. You know, what I also learned that it was re really sad how weak the research capacity was in developing countries. So we wanted to strengthen the research capacity just by doing research together. Uh, then close interaction, collaboration with funding and implementing agencies and active in research, consulting and teaching. Of course, main focus on research. Consulting was always very important for us to keep in touch with the real problems. And I could have a whole hour talk about our interesting uh, consulting things. But I think I, I took that from the principle of Erbach that all consulting should not compete actually with the private sector, but it should always be a learning, it should have a research component and learning for us. Teaching, several times we were actually thinking if we should have a course on water supply and sanitation for people in developing countries, and we always said no, uh, mainly because of language reasons, and there were other VEDEC or IAG who had other, other courses. But we were involved in teaching from the beginning, uh, but the, the focus was actually teaching to people in Switzerland. For instance, we were involved at ETH, engineering at ETH, at Nadel, and so on from the beginning f to sensitize people about problems in developing countries. So, networking was always very important. I spend a lot of, uh, of doing networking with NGOs, with uh, multilateral development agencies and research institutions. And I think still today, I think this is important for, for Sandek and I Sandek is also profiting from the big network that we were building up at, in early times. Now let me come to some of the first uh, research projects that we did in these first couple of years. One was the risk of groundwater pollution by on-site sanitation. You know, there was a big discussion at that time. The conventional engineer, they said, on-site sanitation, forget it. That's just dangerous. You are just polluting the groundwater. And there was no scientific evidence if that is the fact or that is not the fact. So we did this work with a hydrogeologist, Stephen Foster, uh, and there were, there were some WHO guidelines that you have to have a separation between a latrine and a borehole, 20 meters, period, minimum 20 meters. Did not take care of what kind of soil it is, what kind of groundwater situation. So we did this, uh, this study and we were able to come up with sort of a, an, uh, an algorithm uh, how to do this. Then. Then I, you know, we present, we published, we presented, and in one of the presentations, uh, people from India came to me and said, thank you very, very much, but doesn't help us at all. I said, why? Well, we have to know, does it have to be two meters or five meters? If we do it 20 meters or 15 meters, forget it. Because you have to imagine, you know, we had, they had these plots. On one side, they had a hand pump. On the other side of the, of, the, of the plot, there was the latrine. And then the neighbor had uh, maybe the, 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 the hand pump next to the latrine. So the question was, is it two meters or five meters? What, what, is, what is real? So then we, did, we, we came up with these, uh, with these uh, uh, field research in West Bengal, Kerala and Bangladesh. And actually we said, okay, why don't we make around the pit uh, an a sand envelope and study uh, what is now the travel of the pathogens if we have this sand envelope. So it's a field research on the effectiveness of, uh, of sand envelope on the pollution travel from the trees and we could find out that if we have a good sandy material around it really helped a lot. 
Uh, then we did some entomological studies of on-site sanitation systems in Botswana and Tanzania. Peter Morgan, many of you know him, uh, he actually did very interesting work, developed this VIP latrine in Zimbabwe. You know, at that time, that was just when, uh, when Rhodesia was still uh, banned because of the apartheid uh, policy. So there were interesting developments done in Zimbabwe, and I think we learned a lot. But uh, so we did entomological studies on the assess of effectiveness of, of this ventilation pipe, what is happening actually to the insect breeding, because people said, you know, when you, when you have these uh, pits, you know, the, the insects are coming out, they are uh, sitting down. And so, so we, did, uh, we did some work on that. And uh, also uh, uh, Peter Hawkins at that time, he was one of my first consultants. He did research on the, on the flow in this tube. And we actually found, you know, at that time people said, you have to paint this black so that it goes, that it has a chimney. And we actually found out it's not the black, it's much more important, the wind which goes over. Anyway, just sort of a, that you get a flavor for what kind of project we did. Now this picture makes me now very sad because I just learned that uh, Pierce Cross, this is Pierce Cross, uh, he died a few, few days ago. And uh, Pierce Cross, you know, I was looking for sociologists who are interested in sanitation. And it was extremely difficult. Nobody, not only engineers, but also they don't want to work with shit. You know, I mean, it's, this is just not the way to do it. And uh, so he was actually one of the very, very few. And uh, he did for us this review of social cultural aspects of local sanitation in developing countries, looking at factors which inhibit usage <coughs> of latrines and so on and so on. And now one of the important figures in this report, if you look at it, is, and this is sort of a symbol, Toilet design needs to take account of user preferences. Uh, of course, this picture was then misused by some of my dear colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, now I can laugh about it, but uh, I, was, I didn't think it was always very funny when they called me the fetal Khomeini, you know, that was the time of uh, Iran revolution. Well, today I think I take it as a compliment basically. <laughs> you know, but at that time, and as I said in the beginning, I told you in the beginning, you know, if we would have given a talk about sanitation, there were maybe a few people coming, but never this crowd. I think Martin can talk, uh, could talk about that. Anyway, but I also had my satisfactions, I must say. You know, when I gave sometimes a talk, a talk, I think it was in India, and then people came afterwards to me and said, they heard about this organization, Airbach, which is also in, uh, in, in, in near Zurich. Is actually Airbach part of Sandek? <laughs> 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 and I said, no, it's quite the other way around. But, <coughs> but it showed me that we are on the right track. Okay. And then an important, uh, you know, when I came back from, from Stanford, actually, I felt anaerobic uh, processes are very promising because very little sludge production. And I was very impressed that uh, anaerobic processes are, are uh, very, uh, you know, you, you, we, we, were, we had actually anaerobic filters. We could sit it there, let it sit, and after a year, we heated it again and it worked. So I thought that's the way we probably have to go. So we did then, and David Stuckey uh, joined me then uh, for, for a short time. We did a review on the integrity of anaerobic digestion, because I must feel, I felt this is probably the way to go. And the other thing we did, and some of you recognize this kind of picture, actually we did uh, anaerobic process. We did research anaerobic processes long time before Borda then, then, then picked it up and now uses in the Israel system. Because my idea was actually, you know, if we have latrines, we have uh, the removal of fecal material, 
then we always knew that solid grey water is the big issue. So my idea was maybe we can have latrine and we can treat grey water in this such kind of a system and this discharge it directly to the urban drain. So this uh, was done and it was done uh, quite successfully. Another project, you know, one picture I took home from Dar es Salaam when I was Dar es Salaam, pit emptying by hand, very appalling. So actually we then decided to do some evaluation of the problem of pit emptying, what, how this uh, stuff looks like. And then we did some experiments with different kind of uh, pit emptying systems. Here even hand one, then more, more sophisticated one, Duncan Mara, the people who know him. Uh, and uh, so we did, we, we actually wanted to try out what is the, the effectiveness or how strong has to be the vacuum uh, for uh, different distances and for different kind of material. Anyway, don't go into detail, but we also had some really shocking moments because one of that, uh, of these, uh, uh, these machines, which were basically all, uh, you know, trial machines, this here, an, an English firm who came up with, uh, with this machine, and this is not smoke, but this is shit. You know, they had a very, very smart device to keep the... It was a big, big fan, but they had a nice device to, to keep the, the sludge going into the fan, and they were like, BUFF! And so we were standing around, and this was all the shit. Anyway, some of us had to then uh, recover, as you see here. You see here. Okay, then 1982. So I was joined by Martin. Uh, one you recognize because he basically looks like today. Isn't he? <laughs> uh, well, the other one changed a little bit. Still looks very young, but changed his lifestyle a little, uh, his uh, hairstyle a little bit. Probably also the lifestyle. Anyway. Okay, so let's go to the work that they did. Now, Martin Wegelin, let's start with him. Of course, he is very well known as Mr. Sodis. You all know him as Mr. Sodis. But uh, Martin had a life before Sodis. <laughs> so actually, he worked on the treatment of surface water by horizontal flow roughing filters followed by slow sand filter. The idea was that, you know, you have a slow sand filter, very well established, successful uh, technology. But the problem with this technology was it didn't like at all turbid water. El then it gets blocked. So the question is, how, what can we put between? And actually, Martin was, uh, just came back from Dar es Salaam. He was uh, at the University of Dar, Dar es Salaam. He had an appointment there, paid by SDC. And in Dar es Salaam, he already started work on this horizontal roughing filter in the lab and in the field. So he came to ask Eavag if we would be interested to continue this work. And I was really excited because I think I felt this was really an ideal match. Why is it an ideal match? Because at that time, Marcus Boller, that's how he looked at that time, so that you see him now still around. Some, uh, so he helped actually, because he just had finished a PhD on filtration, on contact filtration. So he was the perfect person to, to, to work together with Martin, and they then set up, this, uh, this uh, lab station, uh, the, a pilot station in, in, in Tüfenwies. And so this was really a big, and that's what I always in a way felt, that is exactly the way how it should work. People from Erwag with their knowledge uh, join with people and with the problems from developing countries. So, 
So then they were able to come up with design, design parameters and so on and so on. And uh, 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 plants were built in different situations, different countries. And of course, based on that, uh, then a lot of documentation pre pre were prepared. And at the end, in 1992, the program basically finished with a big international uh, workshop at the Wasserversorgung in, in Zurich, here, here in Zurich. So that was the end of this project and with, I would like to show you that because this is also part of our concept that we had at that time. Uh, I always felt, because we are so small and we work on, on one issue at a time, we have to stop at a certain time. As a research institution we should not endlessly walk on, uh, work on one technology and then promote this technology, but we should stop. <laughs> so this, uh, this then stopped uh, basically in 1992 and then afterwards was just some consultancy. And, but at the same time starting a new project and that was basically the start of the SODIS project. And that of course you are probably much more familiar goes back to that uh, publication which was uh, published uh, from some work done at the university at the American University in Lebanon. And since that uh, publication, it was always floating around that one can use solar radiation for disinfection. <coughs> but there was no scientific evidence about it. There were some laboratory studies done, but then the university was destroyed in the war and so on. And that was always floating around. So I said that's ideal for, we said that's ideal for Yavok. We have the scientific knowledge to find out. And we went to our dear colleagues, the chemists, the biologists, and said we would like to try that out. And they laughed at us. <coughs> no, Paul, that's too weak, isn't it, Martin? They said, cannot work, forget it. But if you know Martin, very insistent, he said, let's do it, let's try it. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, in the lab first, then in the field outside, here behind the, the, the building, was tried out, and sure enough, we found out that it can work. It has the potential to work. So then, I think the rest you probably know, you know, then Martin promoted this, different places and I think a big a big breakthrough was 2001 when finally WHO accepted this technology as a, as an option for removal of pathogens in drinking water. It was a long fight but finally it uh, was done and of course here also then they got the well-deserved rewards for, for SODIS. And I think the rest is history, you know. Uh, you know, I think that was in 2012. That's the latest numbers I had, uh, what the situation was. So this was a very successful work. So that was basically work by Martin Wegerin. Now let's go back to 1982 and look at the group for water, uh, uh, sanitation and wastewater. There the first project was on health aspects of night soil and sludge use in agriculture and aquaculture. Martin, do you remember? <laughs> okay. So what was the motivation? We knew that the use of night soil, nice word of excreta because it's, it was basically removed at night. Night soil had a long tradition in China and Southeast Asia. Wastewater was also widely used mostly untreated, and there, were, there existed reuse guidelines by WHO and especially also for the US, but these were extremely strict. And the result of that was these guidelines were never followed. And they were only based on theoretical potential risk and not on epidemiological risks. 
And for instance, uh, 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 I remember the first collaboration we had with the Topoli Institute in Basel was actually, I did a trip with Marcel Tanner and uh, we wanted to look at the impact of reusing this and we thought, well, we probably find terrible uh, health situations. But then when we looked at the health statistics in the, in the local organization, we find out well, it's not that bad at all. And why was it not bad? Because in China, everything was cooked. Nothing was eaten raw. So at that time, so, so that shows that there is really, uh, you know, if you look at the epidemiological evidence, it looks, it looks very different. And so Martin Strauss started a project uh, with the objectives of determining the actual risk related to use of excreta, uh, highlight the sociocultural, technical and institutional aspects of such practice. And this was actually complementing work that uh, was also done at, w at the World Bank, uh, UNDP World Bank program. By the way, the UNDP World Bank program that I mentioned before, founded by uh, John Calvin Martin, was actually the organization which became later the Water and Sanitation Program, uh, <coughs> which was actually one of the most, I would say in our field, the most successful, the most interesting uh, program that, uh, that, that, that was done. So, but that also goes back to basically John, John Calderwood. So, reports were produced, Martin, isn't it? Uh, uh, Piers Cross, dear Piers Cross, uh, again on existing practice and beliefs in the use, so the sociological aspects. Then Martin spent a lot of time looking at the survival of excreted pathogens and fecal sludge in soils and crops. And uh, together with uh, Deborah Blumenthal and Richard Feacham from the London School, they looked at the epidemiological perspective. So these reports then were sort of a basic for a big international group of experts meeting in Engelberg that we brought together in Engelberg. And what came out was the so-called Engelberg Report. And that was the first preliminary guidelines, basically look at restricted and unrestricted uh, use, and uh, as Paul Shelley also looking at epidemiological evidence. So in a way, that was a breakthrough. And then another meeting took place. We organized in Adelboden and uh, they reviewed the guidelines for the safe use of wastewater and excreta, which actually replaced the 1973 WHO guidelines. Now you wonder Engelberg and Adelboden. Well, we organized these uh, in these mountain places because it was mainly Richard Feach who said, look, if you want me to come, if you want us to come, bring us to a nice place. And now Switzerland has nice mountains, if you bring us to a nice place, we all come. <laughs> and sure enough, they really came. <laughs> and, and one Adelboden, for the second meeting, that I have to tell you, because that's really funny. Uh, for the second meeting, when it was already organized, I called up Richard Feacham and said, the next meeting we are going to have in Klosters. And on the other side was silence. And then suddenly he said, Roland, you cannot do this. I said, why? What's wrong with Closest? You know, Closest, that's the place where our royal family goes skiing. <laughs> you cannot organize a workshop on shit, on wastewater, <laughs> maybe even come up with a Closest report related to shit. And because in, in okay, so. So that was sort of the, so we quickly had to change to another place that I knew pretty well so we could do that. I found that pretty, pretty funny. And then of course these guidelines were sort of uh, basically in effect till uh, of course the, it was further developed and in 2006 the new 
guidelines came out based on risk assessment, basically. But I think till 2006, this was uh, this was quite uh, a, a guiding a guiding document. Maybe one thing which I find very special on this document was, and I think that also goes back a lot to the to the to the merit of of of, of Martin Strauss. I think it was the first time that one really looked at different control measures, you know, not just looking at the, at the wastewater and the quality of the wastewater, but there are really different control measures like crop restriction, like application measures, what people do, because of course they also found out that the biggest risk is actually with the workers, not with the consumers. So, so I don't go on to, into detail, but uh, I think this was also a breakthrough in the whole thinking about, uh, about reuse of excreta and, and, and waste. Well, yeah. This, yeah, please. This was Ursula Blumenthal's uh, creation, because I don't earn the merit. For okay, this good, good. You know, fake news, and, uh, <laughs> but now you got the, the, real, the real fact. Thanks very much. But it was in one of the publications with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Anyway, so also that project came to an end in 1990. And I must say, I was sometimes pain in the neck for Martin. And that I said, now you have to stop this. You know, we cannot continue on that and that. And, uh, but uh, it, it, it came to an end in 1990. And... Uh, uh, Martin Strauss, together with Ursula Blumenthal, I think it was with Ursula, isn't it? The, what we later called, referred to as the Reuse Bible, isn't it? So here they really looked at different uh, case studies of untreated wastewater, Mexico, Chile and India, treated wastewater, excreta use in agriculture, and, and so on. So one got really a nice big spectrum what the use is uh, related to to wastewater use in uh, agriculture and in aquaculture. And then when this was finished, we were again talking about what should be the next project. And uh, Martin said he would be really to look at fecal sludge. And I was extremely happy because we knew that fecal sludge is a big issue and nobody works on it. We did some early project on pit emptying that was also sort of a, a, a fecal sludge project. So he came up with, or we then uh, uh, designed a project in three phases basically. First, a state of the situation review of treatment, disposal and use of fecal sludge. Again, what, what is actually the problem? And then some very intensive field research was done just one picture from AIT, that was, we did that in close collaboration with the people at AIT. And then of course the first phase was the synopsis and interpretation of data from this field research. Well, a lot of reports came out, I think they are on the, on the web page, I can't, don't go into the details now. But I would like to mention that some of the collaborators of Martin uh, that probably some of you know, like Agnes Montagero, she was working with Martin for some time, and then Dulai Kone, uh, here, Dulai Kone, and this is uh, Tamarat Kotatep from AIT in, uh, in, uh, in Bangkok. And uh, of course there were many more collaborators, but these are the ones that maybe some of you still know. And, of course, this project then, when Martin left, was taken over by Linda. And I think it's really now, uh, you know, I think uh, Sandek is considered to be the, the organization on fecal sludge management. First, also thanks to Martin and now, of course, thanks to, to Linda. So this is really great. And I think, Martin, we could only dream in the year 2000 that there will be sometimes fecal sludge management conferences. <laughs> you know, that, 
Martin yeah, isn't. Nobody was interested. Martin, nobody was <laughs> interested. It's just shit. It's just dirt. It's just you know, and and no minister would talk about uh, shit or any. I mean, I said Martin was always who talked about shit, and I said Martin, don't use this word, you know. <laughs> and uh, but uh, now it's uh, it's uh, it, it's well, one even talks about the the the, the shit flow diagram. Yeah. By the way. By the way. Uh, Agnes Montagero, I don't have time to go into that now, she did with us a PhD on material flow analysis because the, 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 the department at EAWAG so, and Solid Waste Management Department, well, it was no more called Solid Waste, but anyway, they actually developed this uh, methodology on material flow analysis, you know, how material flows through a whole system. And today we talk about flow shit, a shit flow diagram, <coughs> uh, shit flow, and it's basically the same thing. But it's uh, and I, I already at that time I think that should be the next step, that we don't only talk about uh, about the materials, but we really talk about about the shit. And this is now being done, and and their work, uh, Sandek is heavily involved in that. As, as I know and as I'm very happy about it. Uh, yeah, 1990 was, well, I was given 30 <coughs> minutes, but anyway, so. Uh, so in 1990, first project related to solid waste management took place because I actually used the, my sabbatical, my first sabbatical in 1990. I always felt solid waste is important because it's closely related to sanitation, it's closely related to water supply. So I spent my sabbatical at the World Bank and learned about solid waste management. And uh, so when I came back, then we identified the problems, issues and so on. And uh, Roger Pfamater at that time was also with us and he published the first Sandek report. Before they were all IRCW reports, it was the first Sandek report. And uh, we looked at non-governmental refuse collection in law in common areas, involvement of private sector, NGOs, and so on. I don't go into the detail. First Sandek report. A small story about that. When we changed the name in 1995, some people came to me and said, Finally, you have the right name, <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> and, you know, we, we had a fight. We had sometimes a fight in Elma. People said, you guys are just traveling to these nice places. <laughs> so just call yourself Sunday. That's the right name. <laughs> and we had to convince them that's a myth. The reality looks like this. So, anyway. So let me come back now to and slowly finish. I think we were also, I told you how important for us it was always the big networking, outreaching. That was always at the center. So we did also the networking in Switzerland. And actually, many of you know Aguazan. The first Aguazan meeting took place here at Erwag in 1983, because I called in SDC, Scott Helvetas, for a common meeting that we should exchange among ourselves uh, regularly. So that started in 83, and you know how it's still going. It grew, and I think it's still very much alive. But that also started here at Airbag. In 1987 was the uh, we were also participating in the consultation in Interlaken, which was, came to the establishment of the Collaborative Council of External Support Agency, which later on became the, uh, the, uh, the Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council Secretariat in Geneva. Many people of you may have heard. This council was very important for us because it was a neutral international coordinating body with research institutions in water supply, sanitation and hygiene sectors, uh, but not only research institutions, uh, funding agencies, bilateral agencies, governments and so on. So, and actually 
it was in also in this context that we were actually participating in several of their working groups. I had the, the honor and pleasure to, to chair one of the working group on environmental sanitation, where people tried to say, why is environmental sanitation not happening? So, and in that context, we developed the Bellagio principles for sustainable sanitation, basically saying that we have to move from a linear top-down planning approach to a <coughs> circular bottom-up top-down planning approach, putting the household and the community at the center, that waste should be considered a resource. You'll maybe laugh about that, but at that time that there was real, I mean, the conventional engineers told us that we are the special people from the WHO, that we are unethical, that we people we put people on jeopardy when we, when we reuse uh, wastewater and so on. And uh, so that, uh, that uh, waste should be considered a resource and then of course uh, looking more at decentralized uh, uh, solutions. That the problem should really solve at the place uh, where, where it, is, it is created. So based on that then the HCS guidelines were developed and of course you know that later on this was then uh, came to the community-led urban environment sanitation planning approach uh, which is basically you know this was then tested in different places and uh, so this was the revision basically of this of this approach. We called it at that time provisional guideline because we knew that this is only provisional and here it's now complete. <laughs> what is it? Complete? Complete? Guidelines. 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 Anyway, so now they are complete with a lot of tools. Great, wonderful. One thing I also would like to say that we already did here. You know, if we are serious about that people should get involved in the decision making, we have to give them the tools. And that was sort of when we said we need, we need a collection of different technologies. What are the pros? What are the cons? Because one thing that I experienced in my field was always people said, thought there is one silver bullet. And people, even research institutions were promoting only one thing. I could tell you to which person to go to get what kind of answer. I knew when, when I said to Duncan Mara, I knew what kind of an answer. I don't tell you now, Mara. So, so that was one of the big problems, actually. And I said, we don't have to do, we re, as researchers, we have to show what is the potential, what are the limitations for each of these different technologies. And then fortunately, we had Liz uh, T, who joined us and was finally willing to start working on this on this, uh, on this compendium, which became, of course, uh, a, a great success. Now, I think I should come to an end, but uh, there are many things that I should have told you. Uh, I think one of, I said you in the beginning, one of our main, main goals was to sensitize people in Eavag for the problems in developing countries. That was always our, one of our main aims. And I was very happy that some people then joined me in this work. One I really would like to mention is Michael Burke. We had the pleasure to work together in a big SDC funded project in Vietnam, in my science technology for Northern Vietnam. He was dealing with, uh, 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 with Environmental Chemistry Institute and I was dealing with, with uh, Environmental Technology Institute and this is and now, if I look around, this of course has been taken off with many others, especially also with the social scientists. And I'm extremely happy about that. I'm really extremely happy about that. Now I really have to come to an end. <laughs> I would like to thank you very much. And I just wish good luck, a lot of success. This is Sandek today. Remember how it was in 1980? <laughs> Me. Sylvia, Brigitte, and please 
think about these three pictures. When you feel sometimes like this, and I'm sure you do, Liz, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Don't give up. <laughs> Nothing is impossible. Thanks very much.